Hey, I'm Michael Crane and welcome to this episode of Fort Worth Forward. We're coming to you from JD's Hamburgers on the west side of Fort Worth and we'll have Gigi Howe uh, with JD's Hamburgers today. We'll be talking to her as well as Orlando Carvalho who is with the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History and Terrence Butler with Academy 4. Let's get started. My first guest today I'm very excited about a uh, great hamburger spot on the west side of Fort Worth called JD's Hamburgers. It's Gigi Howell, who's the operating partner of JD's Hamburgers. Welcome, Gigi. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for being out here at JD's. I know, it's such a beautiful spot. Thank and you. This, I, I, I would say this, this area is going through a renaissance. Um, Do you agree? I would agree with that, and I'm super happy to be part of it. It's, it's amazing that you're here, uh, and if people aren't familiar, tell, tell them where you're located. So we are at 9901 Camp Bowie West Boulevard, which in my family, this is Highway 80. Yes, it's always been Highway right, 80. That's right. Um, we are located just near Margie's um, mm -hmm. original Italian kitchen, which a lot of people are familiar with. Um, the old Naughty Pine, the old um, Last Call. Last the call. Last Call was what this was called. Um, a, a gathering spot for um, the biker group Trula Chasers, which raise a ton of money here in. Fort Worth and Tarrant County for MHMR, still our next door neighbors. Um, and we're just getting to know everybody in the area and, and having a great time being out here. Well, it, it, it is an amazing little spot that most people probably don't know about. And I think there's a lot of history here. Westland is what it was called. And it was kind of yes. at one point its own little municipality or before becoming for, part uh, of Fort Worth. I don't know all the history. but So it was basically um, just a, an area that um, a lot of people moved and gathered here in Westland on the west side of Fort Worth. Uh, my family in particular, uh, great grandparents, great two sets of great aunts and uncles, my grandparents, when they moved to Fort Worth, they settled here in Westland. Um, so I grew up out here on the weekends, wow. in the summers, just running around Mary's Creek, crawdad fishing, catching frogs, whatever. Um, and it, it was certainly one of those times where the street light comes on and, and you go home. Right. Um, and I think in the area back when they lived here, you might not see your kid for a couple of days because they're just at someone else's house. Right. Um, that was nothing, it was never a worry. People right. just all got along here. They had an area where they, they voted, they went to school, um, they did plays, the adults did plays for the kids in the community here. Um, and it was called the Westland Civic League. Um, and if you're ever out at the restaurant, you'll see quite a few pictures inside. But um, I, I think that this area kind of went through a stage where it wasn't, the, the family place that it was where everybody gathered together. And so um, my partner Burke and I, um, we love this area. We want to see this area come back. We want people to know what their next door neighbors names are. Um, and, and we'd love to be a spot where people gather. And that's what we're hoping to become for the that, area. That kind of philosophy why you picked this area? Absolutely. Um, it, you know, with the family history here, uh, Burke and I have been wanting to do something together for a long time. There hasn't been the, the one spot that came up that we were like, let's do it. Um, when he brought me here before the transformation, yes. I think most people probably would have been like, eh, I don't know, but we looked at each other and we were like, yeah, let's do it. I think we can do it. So we're happy to be here. Well, uh, it is a beautiful spot and it is this uh, area that spent some time over here in my district too, that is transitioning into what was, can be again, I think and so. it sounds like we're in the middle of the country that you're you're explaining, but we're really not. We're no. like less than a mile from 820. Yes. Um, and on Camp Bowie or Highway 80, as I call it too. Yes. And you mentioned Margie's. You've got Dylan's Craft across the street. I mean, Dane's, just, Dane's Craft Barbecue. Dane's Craft Barbecue. Yeah. That's right. Sorry, I've, I've murdered that one. But just a lot starting to come over this side, and we're just very close to Lost Creek, and then out to the rest, all the west of part of Fort Worth that's gonna develop out. Absolutely, we've got so many new rooftops in the area. We've got Walsh Ranch, um, yeah. Lost Creek that you mentioned's yeah. been here for a good long time. We've got Montserrat, yeah. Monterey, we've got um, All Saints High School yeah. over here on sports, um, and, and more rooftops coming into the area. I'm actually going to be moving into the area in about a week, so oh, I'm really? happy to be over here too. Thank there you. There you go, there um, you go. So I just think that we have a lot to offer the community um, a gathering place, um, hopefully part of a revitalization of the area. Um, and, and we just look forward to being able to serve the community here. Well, that's wonderful. You have 
been in the hospitality industry for a long period of time. Why do you like it? What do you do? You kind of tell us a little bit about yourself. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I believe that some people might think um, it's crazy, but I absolutely love being in the restaurant industry, the hospitality industry. I think that, um, uh, one, I love food, so that, that bodes well for me. Um, I have- You gotta love food, right? If oh, you're gonna 100%, do this. 100%, 100%. And people probably too, right? Yes, yes so yes. I love to serve people. Um, I love to make people happy. I love to be the person who anticipates their next need and I meet it before they even know. Um, and, and that's what gets me going. And so um, having a food platform is definitely the best way to do that for people. And so um, I, I've just always loved it. I, I started, you know, for extra money in a restaurant back uh, when I was a teenager, worked for Ed Lowe of Celebration Restaurant, who taught me so much about serving people and um, just taking care of guests. Uh, my grandmother growing up, she always thought that the best good manner you could have is making people feel comfortable. Sure. I agree with that 100%. Um, and so that's what we want to do here. And and. I, I don't know. It just it's it's what melts my butter, so to yeah, speak. That's good. Um, I just I just love serving people. That's, that's great. This this is a fun spot. My family have been here. We've been here uh, several times. Yes. Because the burgers are good, the the uh, fried okra oh, yeah. fries are good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm getting hungry right now thinking about <laughs> it. Um, but I you know we've done a lot of uh, spotlighting on this show about small businesses, and I'm put you on the spot a little bit. Um, because I talked to Burke a lot during the process of the getting this open, but if you had advice, I mean, I, I truly believe that, that small businesses are our backbone. We have to do what we can to support them and make sure that they can open easily and thrive here in the city of Fort Worth. But if you had some advice to give to someone that's thinking about starting, opening, and, and running a small business, what, what would you say to them? Um, I would say there's definitely got to be a lot of planning before you even take your, your things to the city. Um, I think that the city um, has been helpful in most aspects and, and sometimes been a bit of a roadblock. And, and we're coming off of a really strange time with uh, the pandemic. And so I feel like um, there's a lot of confusion at the beginning of trying to get stuff started. There was for us. Um, and, and I think that if you have all of your financing, all of your ideas and thoughts, everything collected before you even go to the city, I think that 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 provides such a good platform for you both to get together in your relationship and move forward. That's good good advice. And I would say too, you kind of brought up this idea of having, in essence, your paperwork all together. Um, and I think some people go, I have an idea, let me, let me just do it. But there's yeah. some steps you gotta do in between. You may have your own financing, but you gotta look for financing. And you know, putting those ideas on paper where someone else can believe in your dream just as much as you do. Absolutely. I think is also important, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, when Burke and I first started talking about doing something, that we have had several other ideas that, like I mentioned earlier, that maybe those things weren't going to transform into what we, what we dreamed. Um, I am very guilty of making storyboards. Sure. I mean, and I'm talking, I have boards around the house that it, it comes to a point where they're like, okay, are we done with this one? Can we get this one out of the way? So um, we started that way. We put everything down on paper. We put our dreams on paper. We put our thoughts and beliefs down on paper. Then you have to bring in an architect and then you have to bring in people that can help you envision your dream, that they're on the same page as you. Um, and, and when I say that, um, you can't just have the idea, you can't, because when you get to the city, they're gonna say, well, we need this, this, and this. Right. So do your research on the website and, and even through your city council mm -hmm. people in your area, use those things to get prepared to go before the city. And I think that that will help tremendously. That's great. Well, I wish you all the success here. Thank you You'll so much. You'll keep having some crane money coming towards That's, you, I promise help me, you. Help me pay the light bill. That's <laughs> what I like pay to Pay the light bill. Yeah. Because it's a great spot and I really appreciate all you're doing. Thank and, you so And helping much. revitalize this part and, and just, just being a part of Fort Worth. Well, thank you. And we appreciate everything you do here oh, for us too. Thank you. I appreciate you it. You bet. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Good to see you. You too. To Thanks you. so much. You're welcome. Now I'm here with Orlando Carvalho, who has done a lot of great things for the city of Fort Worth, but now is the president of the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History. Welcome, Orlando. Hey, thank you, Michael. Great to be here. Thanks. Well, I um, have long been an admirer of yours, and I know recently you were asked to step into this president role uh, with the museum. How's that going? How did that sort of come about? Well, back in March, I received a phone call from um, a few of the board members who I know, mm -hmm. and they asked if I could step in as the interim uh, until a new permanent president 
was found. I should have used the word interim president. Yeah, right? yes, but that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and so uh, you know, given the history of the museum and my own knowledge of the museum, uh, I was happy to to go ahead and and step into the role and. Michael, it's been a great experience. Uh, discovered a great team there at the museum, and for the last uh, eight months that I've been there, I think we've been doing a lot of great things. Well, I know you've been doing a lot of great things there. And I, you know, I grew up going to that museum. You know, the summer programs where I learned a lot of science. Uh, you know, I still remember uh, learning the planets from from the, the classes there, where you know you you, you learn Mother Venus eats. Uh, many juicy steaks using no plates, and that's still when Pluto was a planet. So I don't know what sure. they're using now. But um, what are some of the things in the programming that you have? That and, and I know there's there's really a, um, a focus on being all inclusive. That's right. And, and what that looks like across our city as it changes. Well, speaking of all inclusive, mm -hmm. uh, Michael, we um, recently opened up a new playground oh, yeah. at the uh, at the museum that is right off the children's area. Okay. Uh, what was there previously was called the Waterworks. Okay. Yeah. And I think a lot of people like yourself probably remember it and of course in the summertime it was a lot of fun to go out there as the kids and run around in the fountains and and which is why it was called the waterworks a lot a lot of water a lot of splashing uh, but uh, with the ice storms that we had the last few years uh, it really um, uh, damaged the plumbing that 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 supported all that and so the museum made the decision that instead of trying to correct all that we were going to put a playground in, and it's an all-inclusive playground meaning that it's uh, fashioned after the playground that's over by Trinity River, mm -hmm. Dream Park. Yep. Um, a lot of the same companies that supported Dream Park supported our playground, um, which we call Galaxy Park. Yep. And, um, so and really a park speaking, for like physically challenged so they can, right. they can enjoy the playground that's right. as well. That's for, right, for all kids. For all and kids, so yeah. if they have like physically physical challenges, disabilities, whatever, uh, they too can still enjoy the uh, playground. And um, it's important. It's, uh, we're really excited to have it open. We, we had the ribbon cutting on October 8th. And, um, I was and there. You were there, that's right. <laughs> I, that's right, Michael. I, I almost forgot that, that's right. You know, you helped us cut the ribbon. I did, I did, and, I did. Um, it's so, wonderful. Uh, so no, it's um, it's a, another kind of step in the right direction yeah. to make the um, to make the museum good for everyone. We um, we also are going to be opening in the next few weeks a new um, mother's area there in the children's area, mother's room, okay. where you know a, a mom or a dad or whoever, if they need to take their child and um, change the diaper or whatever, you know, they'll have a very nice, comfortable room they can do it in. And we're also opening up a room that um, is for in the case of sometimes children get a little bit you know, uh, worked up too much. Sure. A uh, little sensory overload. I wouldn't overload. know anything about that. I don't think that was me as a child. <laughs> <laughs> so we we actually, working with Caltown Pediatrics, we have set up a room where um, it's designed for a parent to be able to take a child in there and just calm the child down. Okay. And, and, and get the child back into a good place that then they can kind of come back into the museum and enjoy everything. So those are going to be opening up here in the next few weeks. We're almost finished with it. And uh, so we're, yeah, we're trying to, uh, we're trying to bring a lot of um, new accommodation for children uh, of all types. Well, I, I, that's wonderful. I hear you talking about accommodations and are, you, are there any planned exhibits or new exhibits that you are yes. bringing as part of the programming? No, thank you for the yeah, question. Yeah. Um, so back in June, we opened up two new exhibits, one that was called A Century of Clothing mm -hmm. and one that was um, a, The Transformation of Weaponry. And both exhibits uh, feature artifacts out of our collection, okay. out of the museum's collection. So a century of clothing, you'll see clothing that dates back to the 1800s, okay. um, women's dresses, men's clothes, et cetera. And in the uh, transformation of weaponry, you'll see everything from knives and spears and swords and sab sabers and things like that, all the way up to some of the firearms that were used in the 19th century, early 20th century. Again, all coming out of our collection. Then in September, we opened up a, um, a medical exhibit that has medical artifacts, again, out of our collection that kind of shows the history of medicine. And again, it goes back to the 19th century, showing the various tools and, and in instruments and the things that the doctors had to use, and also dentists, and, um, and also what they believed, you know, how they thought the circulatory system worked, and yeah. the biology of the body and everything. And it takes you up to kind of where we are today. Wow. Um, so those are three new exhibits that just this summer, you know, came online. And then most recently, uh, Michael, we had the, uh, we call it One Story, One Tribe. Mm -hmm. And we feature the robe of Cynthia Ann Parker. Uh, yes. And of course, here in North Texas, everybody knows the story of Cynthia Ann Parker, Quanta Parker, who was her son. 
uh, part of the Comanche Nation, how Cynthia Ann was uh, captured mm -hmm. as a little girl when she was only nine years old by the Comanche tribe, Comanche tribe yeah. brought back to where they lived and, um, and ended up growing up becoming a Comanche, um, you know, part of the Comanche tribe. Right. And then um, married a chief of the of the tribe and had Kiwana. Yeah. And, um, she and kind of was an ambassador too, right? That's with, right. With the, with the different tribes and with the other uh, uh, people that were around. That's right. And then, um, and then eventually she was captured by the Texas Rangers and brought back to her Anglo family. Um, but uh, in all that, a robe that she had, a bison robe that she had, um, you know, was uh, preserved mm -hmm. and eventually came into the museum. And we have now put that robe on display at the museum. It hasn't been displayed in decades. Wow. And uh, at here in Fort Worth, it's mm -hmm. been, it's been um, at some of the uh, museums like the, the Comanche tribe has and everything, but, um, but it's the first time we've had it in the museum in a long time. And so, um, so we're really delighted to have that. There's, there are artifacts about, about um, Native Americans, about the history of Cynthia Ann, so, um, so those are uh, the new exhibits that we have, you know, four new exhibits, and we're working on more. We have, in fact, we have a, a Mesoamerica pottery exhibit that's gonna be coming online here right before Thanksgiving. It'll feature all the clay and pottery that goes back to the pre-Columbian, pre-discovery pre of North America by Christopher Columbus. And uh, so, you know, obviously very, very old artifacts that we'll have on display. That's, that's amazing. I, I went and saw the Green Book exhibit that was there for a yes. little while, which was interesting to sort of put in perspective of African Americans trying to travel across the United States, where they could stay, where they couldn't stay, you know, where they were allowed, et cetera. So it was interesting as, as we have to know our history to under, and understand our for history sure. to make sure that we're moving forward. You talk a lot about the programming in there, but y'all do a lot of outreach too. We do. In different ways. You want we to do. talk about that, the sure. outreach you do? In fact, to kind of set up the outreach, let me talk about the museum school, the school sure. you went yes, to. Yes, yes. Um, so for those who may not be familiar with uh, the museum school or even the museum, um, the museum school is how the museum began. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to 1945, uh, when 16 uh, women teachers started the museum, what, what is now the museum, they really started as an after school program. Okay. And, uh, and so from there, it then grew into the Children's Museum and then grew into the museum that we have today. So our, our beginnings are in the museum school and everything that we do now is an extension out from the museum school. So, uh, so in addition to all the classes that we offer at the museum for kids that are three, four, five, six years old, the classes that you attended, et cetera, uh, we also go out to um, the schools. We have a discovery lab that we take out to the schools. Um, we have other various programs um, that, uh, that we'll, we'll go to the schools. And basically the idea is, how do we bring the museum to the schools and to the kids? And some are for the younger kids, some are for the older kids, but it's taking advantage of all the, the products and the capabilities and the teachers that we have and bringing it out to the schools. That's, that's, uh, that's wonderful. I, I would say I probably speak for most of the viewers they really know the museum because of the Omni. <laughs> Traveling there yes. when they were kids to see Omni this in the early 80s, I, 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 if I remember correctly, it was just a new way of seeing films and, and as immersive as you can get. And I, I know that there you have an exciting project uh, lined up that will replace what was the old Omni and, and make it a, a more, more modern immersive experience for That's people. Right. Do you want to talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure, make it, make it a new Omni. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, yes. So, um, so Michael, to your point, I still remember the first time that I went to an IMAX theater. Mm -hmm. It wasn't here at the Omni. It was when I was living up uh, in the Northeast, but mm -hmm. I still remember my first time going to an IMAX theater and how impressive it was to see the film and everything. So I can um, definitely appreciate how people feel about the Omni and just what a wonderful experience it was. So, um, so as you said, the Omni was originally built in the early 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it was opened officially in 1983. Okay. And, um, and it remained open until, until the pandemic shut, uh, shut the Omni down. I was in second down. grade or something at that, at that point. Is that so, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I yeah. can only imagine. It had to be a great, it it had to be a great a fun experience time. for a second yeah. grader, for sure. And um, so the Omni um, was open all those years, very successful mm -hmm. to your point. And um, so when we had to close the Omni with the rest of the museum with the pandemic, um, to reopen the Omni became very difficult. And it became difficult because uh, we lost a lot of the technical expertise um, that had, you know, had left the museum, gone on to other things. So we lost a lot of that technical expertise. The equipment itself had deteriorated a bit uh, from just 
you know, sort of lying there. Electronics equipment, if you're not using it continuously, has a, has a funny habit of um, deteriorating. And, um, and the theater itself really needed a refresh. Um, the seating and, and just the whole venue just sort of needed a little bit of uh, modernization. So as we, as we began to look at that, we realized that rather than try to open, reopen what we had, mm -hmm was there the opportunity here to do a renovation, mm -hmm. do something new? And, um, and so that was the, um, the uh, initiative that we went down on. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered in pursuing that is that in today's world, um, IMAX is kind of yesterday's technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's projection-based technology. In today's world, you really want to be digital. Mm -hmm. um, just like our iPads, our laptops, our iPhones, you want to be digital. Mm -hmm. And there is a company called Cosm that mm -hmm. we began working with and they produce literally a digital dome. Okay. And it replaces the IMAX. Um, think of it as the flat screens that you might have in your home or in a conference room or whatever. Think of a dome that's just made up of those flat screens. Except these flat screens, unlike the ones in our homes that are like four feet by two feet, these flat screens are 10 inches by 10 inches. And they are placed on a steel skeleton that is produced as part of you know, this procurement they're placed on that steel skeleton with magnets. Okay. And then of course everything is wired from behind and those uh, flat screens, that LED technology, digital LED technology, projects the image, just like your flat screen projects it at home. Right. And therefore you get a tremendous amount of brightness, you get a tremendous amount of contrast, you get high definition. The visual picture that you see is just orders of magnitude greater right. than what we had with, with an IMAX projection. So recognizing, you know, the how cutting edge, mm -hmm. you know, um, this technology, technology is, mm -hmm. we, um, we 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 went ahead and started looking at how can we bring this bring to bear. Ahead. And so, long story short, uh, we put together a plan to do a complete renovation of the inside of the Omni. Okay. Um, one of the things we're going to be doing in that renovation, Michael, is we're going to make it um, compliant with the American with Disabilities yeah, Act. ADA, sure. ADA. Yeah. And so now... Which those steep stairs with the IMAX theater were not that way at all. That Yes, yes. that's true. And, and, and within the lobby, for those who remember the Omni, within the lobby, there were many levels yeah. to the lobby. So and we get rid of all out, that. Yeah. We get rid of all that. It's all going to be one level. Mm -hmm. One level into the pre-Q area and then into the Omni itself. The Omni will still be a theater, so it'll still be theater seating. Right. So you're still going to have like those steep stairs on the side, yeah. but we do have elevators and things like that for people that are in wheelchairs or whatever that um, they can access uh, the theater uh, with the elevators. And I think you talked too one about um, being a history museum keeping that old part where you can That's see right. the, the the movies being loaded up and the and the, the projector going up into the to the where it, it yeah projects. into the theater itself and so That's that right. would be a, a kind of a museum that people can see as they're going into the That's the exactly building. right. When you, when you the way we have it designed when you walk into what'll be a pre q area before you walk into the theater and in fact this was true today and in, in the old omni when you would go into that pre q area you could see the technicians loading the films and getting everything ready. Well, all that equipment will still be there. It'll be behind glass. It'll be, as you said, an exhibit of the of the first generation of technology. Um, but of course, there will not be anybody in there doing anything because you know this will now be a digital theater. That's but Michael, I have to tell you what I'm most excited about with making this transition to this technology is that the theater now becomes interactive. Mm -hmm. Okay, because with this dome, we can do anything with this dome that you could do with your iPad or your iPhone. So whether it's remote streaming, whether it's a Zoom call, mm -hmm. you know, that type of thing, having, having people come in remotely to speak to an audience, putting up PowerPoint, uh, putting up other videos, you can have multiple windows up at the same time. You can use it for corporate time. occasions. Corporate events, yes. uh, conferences, yeah. you could use it with uh, lecture series. Sure. So the old Omni was an Omni where you, was a theater where you went there to basically watch a movie, right? Watch, watch a, a film. In this Omni, You'll still be able to do that. You'll still be able to watch videos. And in fact, you know, you're, you're going to see spectacular videos that we'll be able to show in there. Um, but in addition to that, in addition to that, we'll have all these other capabilities that will, will truly make the Omni multidimensional, wow. which we believe the original founders, the original folks who had the vision for the Omni, they gave it that name because they were thinking it was going to be all things. All well, things. now it really is going to be all things. And we're excited about that.
Well, we're excited about two. Is happened last week. The city passed a resolution so to the, pr provide some funding. I think you're in fundraising mode for this now. Is that correct? We we are. We're yeah. you know round numbers. We're trying to raise around 20, 20 21 million dollars. Okay. And um, you know with the with the wonderful gift, the wonderful grant that we got from the city. And thank you, Michael. Uh, of course. Of and course. and all the other council members, sure. so Mayor Parker and David Cook. Um, in addition to that, with everything else we've been working, we think we're within about three million okay. of having all the money raised. Okay. And uh, and so we continue to work that very busily um, because uh, ideally we would love to get started early next year with the renovation. And how long will that renovation take? It'll it'll take about eighteen months. Okay. So once we get started, figure eighteen months later we'll be able to open. So if we get started at the beginning of next year, we're hoping to be open by about the middle of uh, 24. 24. Um, so June, July of 2024 is when we think we'd be open. Great, well Orlando, thanks for being. How can people find you if they want to find the museum and you know, what's your website and, or maybe they want to donate as part of that? Sure, um, the easiest thing would be if you just go online and you do a search on the Fort Worth uh, Museum of Science and History, uh, you'll see our website pop up, go to our website. Um, our marketing team does a great job of putting all our information out there on the website, including contact information etc so that's probably the easiest way to get to us okay appreciate it thank you for being here thank you Michael. yeah of course good yeah, to see you good great to see you, see you too good to see you thank you and now i'm happy to introduce to you terrence butler an old friend of mine that is vice president of development for academy four welcome hey good morning michael good morning good, how good are you doing you. good to I'm see you i'm doing well i'm doing well what an honor to be here uh, on your podcast to share about academy four well academy four does great works and i appreciate all you're doing why don't you tell our viewers what is academy four yes academy four is a fourth grade mentoring program it happens during the school day and how we do that michael is we uh, go out to local churches in the community and then the community, then they actually reach out into the community and get those volunteers. So for instance, I'll give you an example. If there's a hundred children at a fourth grade, Title I fourth grade school, mm -hmm. the church normally gets about 60% and then they go out into the community and that looks like, you know, people they work with, mm -hmm. um, you know, high school students, you know, people in their neighborhood. They read to them, they, hey, what, what well, are they, what's the program? Excellent question. We have our own curriculum. Okay. It's leadership okay. development. Okay. And so we talk often about the math gap and reading gap, and those are very, very important. Mm -hmm. But what we don't talk a lot about is the relationship gap, okay. that social, emotional uh, connection that our children need. Okay, and what what is so important about fourth grade that you do this in fourth grade? Fourth grade, it's really, Michael, it's four things, right? Mm -hmm. So. Children at that age, that nine or 10 year old age, their minds are moving from concrete to abstract thinking. So it's the first time they can talk about or think about, not talk about, but like leadership. Mm -hmm. They're becoming individualistic for the first time. So you have, you have children, yes. so you know, when they're around that nine and 10 year old age, you know, they've, they've listened to mom, they've listened to dad, that's where their morals and values are being shaped, mm -hmm. but now they're actually like reaching out to others, you know, for that. Yeah. And so that's why we want to be the positive influence at such a critical time. Well, you, you know mm -hmm. my children and, yeah. and unfortunately, I think there was Academy One for them or maybe oh, something because goodness. Uh, Ainsley yeah. has my DNA and my wife's DNA fighting it out and she's already already critically thinking about that. But I, I think what that yeah. might lead yeah. into is, uh, you're starting in fourth grade is, mm -hmm. you you know, they always talk about that you from, you know, up until third grade, you're learning to read. Right. Right. And at third grade, you're reading to learn. Absolutely. So then you can start introducing these leadership and other concepts in fourth grade. Is that kind of the idea? Absolutely. And what they've even uh, seen a couple more points about the fourth grade is there's been studies with fourth grade and fifth grade, and the fourth graders fared so much better than their fifth grade counterparts. And this is funny too fourth graders still like adults <laughs> <laughs> and that the erosion of those, those, those relationships and them thinking they know. Right everything starts to happen in about fifth grade in, or sixth in, in grade, fifth grade. Yeah, yeah and we're what you're talking about is like how we impact right mm -hmm. because we these are title one schools so um explain title I, one schools yeah, for people that, very, yeah. Very, very good yeah. that is 60 percent or more students that uh, have free and reduced lunch in those schools okay so let me give you a percentage i believe it's we have about 23 percent poverty in in the u.s mm -hmm. so eight out of the 10 students that we serve at Academy Four are impoverished. So that would equal in a 30 person classroom, mm -hmm. that would be 24 of the 30 students in poverty wow. that we serve. Wow. 
Yeah. And I know you're very active in, in a lot of my schools in the district. Yeah. I know Westcliff Elementary yes. is one where I know you're active. And I think the program is 90 minutes a month, yeah. right? So tell me about that am impact that happens yeah. in 90 minutes a month. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll even share with you, because we get the question, 90 minutes once a month, how does that you know, impact? But it does. So in those in that 90 minutes, the first thing that they're doing is they're doing something we call spark clubs. Okay. And what that happens there is we're sparking that child's imagination. We're at uh, JD's Hamburgers, right? So yeah. um, there's a cooking club. There and so okay. there's cooking and it shows them how to make meals, you know, that they can make at home, okay. nutritious meals. Yeah. There's STEM, uh, there's karate. We have First Tee, we partner with First Tee, so wow. there are several of our schools. Yeah. One of my favorites are the Investigators Club. So we partner with Fort Worth Police and other uh, police forces uh, in, in, in and around Tarrant County. Uh -huh. And canine comes, Mounted Patrol, Motorcycle Police. And so the police are interacting with these kids in a fun learning environment you know, not when there's, you know, a problem. Problem, yeah, and sort of yeah. positive parts yeah. too for kids can understand Absolutely. all the parts that happens in an investigation. It yeah. might be a dog, it might be Absolutely. all the other pieces that happen. Yeah. That's awesome, yeah. that's awesome. What else are you doing serving fourth graders? How, yeah. how else are you serving fourth graders? Yeah, so, you know, we have Academy Four, mm -hmm. but I wanna tell you um, about other things that we have in Academy Four, because people, you know, all the time ask us, and it's a fair question fourth grade but then they go to fifth grade right and so we worked with teachers in the school and we have a follow-on program and it's called leaders five so the last lesson is serve in a leaders acrostic it starts uh, with the listen which i know i can do more of <laughs> and then it ends in serve and so after uh the child has gone through that nine month period in the leadership program they come back the next year and they serve a first grader or a kindergartner in that school and they do that on thursday so they bring a little mini academy for um friday to the school uh we also had you know the question what about middle school mm -hmm. you know the, the will sometimes and you know some of the harder areas yeah. start to come off in middle school so we had uh actually a, a good a way principal. to put it the wheels start coming off in some way shape or form in middle school as i have <laughs> middle schoolers now but yes right i think i understand that part and so we looked around to see if there was a middle school program that fit what we doing that what we were doing to see if we could come along side and partner we couldn't find it so we piloted a program at leonard and it's called meet in the middle okay and so we started that this year and it is doing very well and we know that academy four um leaders five you know meet in the middle these children can have like their best day but if they go home to hard circumstances and i want to be clear their parents love them right they're working hard but what tends to happen is you know like i said that that social emotional time is is can be cut short because right. they have to go to sleep or cook a meal or help the kids with the homework and, and right. you know go to bed and so um we have we've started something as well and it's called four families so we have uh enrichment for parents okay and uh, we also want to bring wraparound services to help those parents and um that's that was kicked off last year as well and then one of my favorites we've been around 11 years uh and it's called full circle scholars okay so I said a little earlier that we have um, high school students that come and mentor in our schools. So that um, that pipeline or or tier that they came through, uh, they they come to uh, become mentors. Excuse me, yeah. and and they can be juniors and seniors at these local high schools. Okay. And uh, are if these they people do, that have gone through the program before, that's exactly and so you yeah. bring them back to help. Exactly. Okay. And that's why they're called uh, full circle okay. scholars. Okay. And so they come and they do that in their junior and senior year, and then they write uh, to us for a scholarship. And so last year we gave out nine twenty-five hundred dollar scholarships to those full circle to mentors. To use to go on to matriculate to college yes, or in a program or something. Absolutely. And several of those students are first gen uh, college students. That's amazing. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear you over in Leonard. I, I love that school and piloting that program there. That's also part of the district and yeah. around the Las Vegas trail area. And so Absolutely. a lot of those kids, as you said too, I love that you said that their parents love them. Absolutely. But time is a, of, of sometimes an issue with them. They're Absolutely. working multiple jobs Absolutely. to try and make ends meet. And so maybe they don't have all the time uh, they should uh, as a parent to make sure they're mentoring. So I'm glad these services are available. You, you mentioned some of them, but some, who are some of your partners that you're partnering with? Yeah, so we partner with, like I said, First Tee, mm -hmm. uh, Casa Mignana, mm -hmm. uh, Williams True, 
in uh, 3M. So there's an array of, of different like organizations that we, you know, Hope Farm, yeah. River Tree. And, and is, is, do they provide financial resources and also um, time resources well, where they'll come and help with the programs? Well, that's a great question. Okay. Really what makes up making our budget is, you know, through some of those companies I named, but really through foundations okay. and individuals. And if someone wanted to get involved, is there, how could they help with yeah. the program? I always say it's two things to, yeah. that makes Academy 4 run, uh -huh. people and money. So they can literally go to our website and I believe that you're gonna just share yeah. that. And they can also uh, look at all the schools. There's 40 schools. Some of those schools are in Austin, but most of those uh, schools are in the DFW area. So they could go right onto the website and look at those different schools and sign up to be a mentor. Well, great. Well, how can people find you? What's the website? Yeah, it's uh, www.academy4.org. Good, and you also mentioned too, you know, uh, uh, the greatest gift catalog ever. You're part of that yes, this year. Yes, absolutely. We're getting towards they Christmas time, uh, which we featured them about a year ago, which was really, really nice. Oh, so I'm great. glad you're a part of that this year. And, and hope some funds will come to you that way too. Yeah, and uh, this week, th thank you for prompting me, uh, if someone gives through the catalog, the, the, the gifts are matched 100%. That's amazing, so that's amazing. So we're, we're excited to be partnering with the greatest gift catalog ever. Good, well Terrence, thanks for all you do. I'm, I'm proud to call you a friend thank you, for a long period here. of time. I appreciate all you do in Fort Worth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today for this episode of Fort Worth Ford. Come out to JD's Hamburgers and try the food. It's amazing. It's also got great atmosphere, as well as donate to Academy 4 and check out the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History for all their latest exhibits and programming. Now I'm going to play some cornhole. Boom! Still got it!